his fantasy and his hatred towards women. The cult compound there went up in flames and burned to the ground. 112 people inside, 17 of them children. Beth was stabbed 100, approximately 114 times. A lot of rage, a lot of anger. The Borchies hit a shotgun and revolver under his trench coat when he entered the school that morning. I was scared for my life. It is just unspeakable evil. She is evil. That is the face of evil. rage, a lot of anger, a lot of fury by that. And, and knowing how many shots were fired and the type of pistol that was used, there had to be at least one reload, if not two. This was really violent. It was just savagery and, and rage that was going on in that short time period inside that shot. It was at least a year or 18 months of frustration. November 2nd, 1983, there was a Corvette shop in League City, 595 West Main, and it was called Corvette Concepts, and it was specialized in repairing Corvettes. The night of November 2nd, one of the owners, Beth Wilburn, an electrician who was not an employee who was there hanging lights, and Beth's boyfriend, uh, Tommy McGraw, were all murdered on, on the scene there inside the Corvette Concepts. Their bodies weren't discovered until November 3rd, the next morning, when the other owner, Bob Curry, came to open the shop and discovered two of the bodies, came out, called the police, and then when the police came in, they discovered the third body of James Otis, the electrician. I'm Richard Renison, a retired FBI agent. Uh, I was uh, one of the investigators that worked on the Corvette Concepts case. Beth Wilburn, who uh, by all appearances was the primary victim and, and most likely the only intended victim, she was found in one of the two offices in the front part of the, of the shop. And the shop had an office area, a customer waiting area, and then five bays where the uh, cars were, would be worked on. Beth was stabbed 100, approximately 114 times and shot four times in the back of the head and the medical examiner determined the shots were post-mortem. Her boyfriend, Tommy, was found um, in the bay closest to the customer service area and the electrician was found at the opposite end uh, of the bays where he was on a ladder working and he was on the ground and his leg was still hung up in chains um, from where he was hanging the chains so they could hang the lights. Tommy McGraw was stabbed approximately 14 times and shot six or eight times. Uh, the, the weapon that was used to stab both Beth and Tommy was a screwdriver. Uh, after Beth was stabbed, we know she was stabbed first because the shaft of the screwdriver was found lodged in Tommy McGraw's spine. The plastic handle had come off, so it was just a metal shaft sticking out. Um, and, and the medical examiner said that Tommy uh, was likely shot first and then stabbed. And uh, unfortunately, he was uh, alive while this was happening and probably lived for a few minutes after that. So it was a, it was a horrible death for Tommy McGraw. James Otis, the electrician, was shot 10 times, but one was just a graze, so there was nine uh, direct hits, and he was not stabbed at all. We know Beth was stabbed first because the object that was used to stab her was lodged in Tommy's back, and it had blood from both Tommy and Beth on it. So, and the amount of stab wounds and then the four post-mortem shots, he wanted to make sure she was dead and he wanted to make sure that he finished her off. 
the electrician, who was not even supposed to be there that night. He was supposed to be there the night before. And then Tommy, by all appearances, walked in while it was happening. And Tommy did have a wound on the back of one of his arms, like, uh, like, from, like he was running. Early investigators focused on Bob Curry as the main suspect because Bob and Beth used to be in a relationship. So that's kind of a person that you should look at, and they did. The, the failing, I think, was that they looked at it to the exclusion of all other suspects or witnesses. It just seemed like he had one person in mind and couldn't really look outside of that. We're looking at just years of time in which no other suspect was looked at, developed, and we had a tunnel vision that was just focused on Bob Curry. Bob Curry was the suspect from the beginning. Bob Curry had to walk around most of his life being the suspect because that's what they pinpointed him as. I'm Kayla Allen. I'm the Felony Division Chief uh, here at the DA's office. My name is Kevin Petroff. I'm the First Assistant uh, District Attorney here in Galveston. What you want to look at in a murder scene, who was the last person to be there? And by Dean's own admission, he was the last person to be there. Eventually, uh, he was uh, interviewed, Jesse Dean Kirsch was interviewed by Rex Fancher, who was the detective that came on in 1985. Rex Fancher, unfortunately, didn't get to work on it very long. I think he only had it about maybe a year. And so, you know, he didn't get to develop as much as he probably could have. I was with League City from 1993 to 2003 uh, when I went to the FBI in 2003 and shortly before I went to the FBI I was assigned the case uh, at League City but it was just a, a few months before I left so I didn't really have time to do a lot of investigation into it but I did have time to kind of familiarize myself with the investigation. At the beginning of 2006 is when I opened the case at FBI at the request of uh, League City uh, requesting assistance. In 2006 when we started working this I was working with League City on it we found a person who'd not been interviewed in the, in the original investigation. And this person was a former roommate of Dean, and they were good friends in high school. He owned a, a business in League City, reputable man, uh, you know, upstanding citizen. If he was roommates with Dean, then he needs to be interviewed. And it, it just slipped through the cracks on the original investigation. So we go to interview this witness who'd never been interviewed and went to his business and, you know, do you know Dean Kirsch? Yeah, yeah, we're friends and roommates. When's the last time you talked to him? It's been years. Uh, do you ever know him to buy a pistol? Well, yeah, I was with him when he bought one at either the Pasadena Gun Show or the Houston Gun Show. Why don't you come down to the police station and, and do a formal interview with us? So he came down the next day and we did a formal interview. This is a guy who's known him since high school. They were friends in high school, remained friends. After the murder, they moved in together. They lived together a couple years. They were still friends. They never had a falling out. They never disliked each other. They just kind of moved off and grew apart. So he didn't have any motive to make any of this up. He told us that Dean wanted him to help make a silencer for this 22 caliber pistol. So they tried one, didn't really work, and then did another one where they welded it onto the gun. So it's on there permanently now. And, um, he said, yeah, that's the last I ever saw of that gun. Don't know what happened about it. He remembers he was with Dean at a gun show where Dean bought a 22 caliber pistol, which is the same caliber that was used in the homicides. So about the time I interviewed this witness uh, with League City, I got a lot of the evidence from League City, including the shell casings and the bullets taken from the bodies and sent those to the FBI lab. A few months later, I get a call from our uh, firearms examiner at Quantico who I've never met before. And they don't read the case file when they do this. They just read, what test do you want done? He said these, the bullets that they took out of the bodies had an anomaly on them 
um, he said they come into they came into contact some after they left the barrel before they entered the victims. And I, I wasn't, I don't, I, what, what do you mean, like a ricochet? That doesn't make sense to me. He goes, no, 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 this is what we see with homemade silencers. And just like right now, the hair on the back of my neck stood up because he had no idea about the interview with that witness who helped make a silencer for Dean Kirsch. So within two month period, years after the murders, we had this connection that really, I think, broke the case open. That's a great piece of evidence, but that's not beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and over the years, we just kept working on it, kept working. As DNA advanced over the years, we were able, uh, there was uh, fingernail scrapings from Beth. The medical examiner at the time was able to get DNA from under her fingernails. It was a mixture of both her DNA, which you would expect, and a male DNA. And so over time, as DNA changed, um, the FBI lab was able to just look at the male DNA included Dean Kirsch, but to a very low number, like one in five, I believe. What the lab was able to say is that Bob Curry was not the originator of that DNA under her fingernails. Being able to exclude him through the DNA was, was really big for us. Wasn't even close to a, a slam dunk. It, the, the DNA was so degraded, but uh, like one in either one in three or one in five white males have that marker on the DNA. Bob voluntarily gave us his DNA sample and compared to what was found in the fingernails and you can definitively say it couldn't be him because he did not have that marker. So the killer had to have that marker. Dean had that marker, but one in three or one in five white males did. So again, not even close to something to hang your hat on, but another piece of the puzzle. Bob had multiple alibis. Um, I interviewed Bob. Um, I certainly didn't get the impression that he was a killer. And as far as we can tell, the murders were right around 8 o'clock. Bob left with his brother Steve at 7 o'clock. He said he went home, took a little nap, um, and he was going out with his friend and his friend's girlfriend to a, a nightclub up in Houston where he was hoping to meet a girl that he'd met the weekend before at a Halloween party. So he was excited about this. So he went to the mall, bought a shirt, and bought a pair of jeans. And he has a receipt from Joski's at the mall. And then he went yeah. to his friend's house, picked up his friend. Then they went to the nightclub, met the friend's girlfriend there, and they stayed there all night. Dean got home around 9.15. That's an hour and 15 minutes after the homicides. Dean says he went straight home. Well, he lived about three miles away. So there's an hour that Dean is unaccounted for. Um, that certainly was a head scratcher. What we had from those interviews is two different versions of events from both uh, Bob Curry and Jesse Dean Kirsch. Bob Curry was able to explain when he left where he went. Uh, he went shopping at some malls. He had a receipt from some of the goods that he bought. He then went to a friend's house who confirmed all this. And then they went to Houston to a bar to meet another couple. And he was there until midnight. Jesse Dean Kirsch had a very different story in which he, he sort of, he left, he says, uh, leaving Beth alive, which we didn't believe, but that he left there and then sort of drove around a bit. Uh, eventually went home and then drove for hours, it would seem, without being able to give us any real description of where he went. Those are two very different versions of, of their activities that night and, and one that further cast suspicion on. And the business wasn't um, prospering so where they were all getting rich and he, if he kills her, then he's gonna get twice as much money. Uh, the business was, was was struggling a little bit, but it was maintaining. So uh, I, I can't see a financial motive in there. developing a task force. We got some League City police officers involved. 
and we started coming up with kind of a, a to-do list. We had a lot of questions that we needed answered, and I think some of the concern was, too, that a lot of the witnesses hadn't been interviewed in a long time, and we needed to see if they were still around, um, still remembered information, and so all those witnesses needed to be re-interviewed. The thing with cold cases is they come to you in different forms, and this one came with 40 years of investigative leads, statements, you know, people have heard this or that on the street. So in 2013, we, we really did put up together a team, and it was Agent Renison, it was our office, and it was League City Detectives. At that time, the fear was we had boxes of evidence, 40 years of just random tips, um, other suspects, there were allegations that maybe these murders were drug related. Maybe it was a cartel hit. Maybe it was some other love triangle that wasn't really clear from the evidence. And so two detectives, Corey Byer and Gina Vogel with League City, took on the Herculean task of running down every one of those leads. What could be supported by evidence? What was just hearsay? To see finally that we were able to have the confidence in charging that there were no other you know, real suspects. There was no other evidence. We found a lot of red herrings uh, throughout the case and, and ran each one completely to ground. When you look at the history of Corvette Concepts, when they first decided to open it, they didn't have a lot of money. And so they had friends helping um, do things and build things. And one of them was Jesse Dean Kirsch, who was building the offices out. And they weren't really paying him to do that. So his thought was that he would kind of be rewarded by working there and making money there. But he wasn't a good mechanic. And so he wasn't making the money that he thought that he should make. And so there was some um, discussions about if he should work there or not. And, and Bob kept him there and tried to make him into a good mechanic and he just never, never was good at it. He was not a skilled mechanic like some of the others. He was, uh, he was more of a parts runner, but Beth would allow him to work on easy jobs. He would put brake pads on backwards and stuff like that and they'd pick up cars and they'd still have the same issue with it. So it just wasn't a good relationship with all of them with regards to his work and and that particular day, I think it all just kind of came to a head. He worked on a Corvette uh, one afternoon for the Myers family. The car was overheating, so back in the 80s, that generally means it's a thermostat. You know, we replaced that. So Dean worked on that car. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Myers came to pick it up uh, around closing time, drove home to Friendswood. By the time they got home, the car was overheating again. And not only was it overheating, but the speedometer wasn't working as well. Mrs. Myers called Beth at around 7.30 that night and gave Beth an earful about, you know, you didn't fix my car, now the speedometer doesn't work. And Beth called Dean into the office and asked him what happened. And Beth was known to be very abrasive and very blunt. Um, she wasn't a tactful person. She was very tough and fiery. She was winning awards from the, the Better Business Bureau. And so back in the 80s, as a woman, you had to be tough to, to be successful. And she was successful, and she was tough. And this was a Corvette business. It's a pretty male-dominated, male-focused uh, uh, business at the time. So um, to be able to stand out as a woman at the time, I, yeah, I could, it doesn't surprise us, I think, that we heard that she could sometimes um, be loud or be aggressive. We were able from the timeline to um, basically limit it to when the two guys who worked on the body of cars um, left. They left Beth Wilburn there with Jesse Dean Kirsch. And that's about the time that they got the phone call from the Myers. The reason that Beth was still there is because um, Bob Curry did have a date and he had told everybody that. So he had plans already. So she had agreed to stay late. And so um, her boyfriend, Tommy McGraw, was coming to pick her up. Some of the witnesses said that he was working on a car when they left and when the other two uh, mechanics left, Dean and the electrician and Beth were the only ones there. And that's also confirmed by Dean in, in a recorded statement. 
then you can look at it by the evidence. I mean, it's a crime of passion. The instrument is an instrument of opportunity. So, I mean, a screwdriver, that's somebody picked that up and grabbed it and, and, and how it was uh, used 113 times um, on Beth Wilburn, 14 times on Tommy McGraw. This doesn't appear to be a calculated, I'm gonna come to work today and kill somebody. It was definitely, he snapped and, and full of rage. There was no robbery. There was no, she had jewelry on, none of her jewelry was taken. Um, it was locked up, um, the doors were down, the lights were off, and to turn the light off, somebody had to be familiar with the shop because it was behind a huge Coke machine that if you didn't know it was there, I mean, you have to reach behind the Coke machine and, and turn it off. So, and all those lights were off, and we know that because two officers went out at 10, 11 to, to check the property. Everybody's got a breaking point. Fortunately, 99.9% .9 of us don't make it. Um, to that point, uh, but apparently Dean hit his threshold at, at, from for whatever reason. An easy speculation is to say that she fired him and he didn't want to be fired. I worked on that case for, you know, 10 years and uh, interviewed him and I felt he was smug, uh, like he's gonna get away with it. So it was good to um, let him know he's not getting away with it. I was sad, sick, disgusted. That was Marie Vickery's reaction when she found out through social media that the man recently arrested, accused of killing her cousin 32 years ago, is now out of jail on a $150,000 bond. 58-year-old Jesse Dean Kirsch was arrested late last month in spring and accused of killing Beth Wilburn, Thomas McGraw, and James Otis. He was Marie Vickery's cousin. For him to be allowed to just get out of jail and have a go free card, you know, which basically as far as I'm concerned, and that's what's happened. I mean, the, is that justice? Wilburn was stabbed more than 100 times. Otis was shot 10 times on November the 3rd, 1983. In spring today, we were told that Kirsch did not want to talk about his release or the charges. A victim's family has a lot to say. What I think is, if we could go back in time and get Craig, that's what I would like to happen, but that's not possible. So, you know, Am I upset? Am I mad? Yes, I'm, I were real upset. I mean, he has three beautiful daughters that didn't get to grow up with him. One that was born right after he died. After he was arrested and indicted and he was released on bond, we met with uh, James Craig Otis's, the electrician, his wife at the time. She reached out to us and said that she found uh, Craig's watch that he was wearing on the murders. We knew, based on the timeline, the homicides happened around 8 o'clock. The watch had the time of 8.04 on it, and the date said 2nd, 2. So that's a really solid piece of evidence as far as when the homicides occurred. Uh, likely he fell, and it was 8.04 on the 2nd. You know, um, the watch hit the concrete, maybe stopped it from running. It backed up what all the other information we had to, to make the timeline. It was basically confirmation that, hey, we got the timeline right. That was another, just another little piece of, of the puzzle. That very quickly narrowed the time frame to about less than an hour of when the Myers called complaining about Jesse Dean Kirsch's work on the Corvette, our belief that she confronted him, and then these brutal murders. The only plausible solution here is the last guy there committed the murders. Um, and then there was evidence to back that up. You had the, the the silencer to back that up. Without the silencer, um, all we have is a guy saying he bought a 22 caliber pistol at one point. Um, I, I, I have no doubt that if the silencer was not part of this, then it, I, I wouldn't have been comfortable taking charges. In my 30 plus years in law enforcement, I've worked one case that involved a silencer, Corvette Concepts. It's not, it's not a, a common thing that you work on. Uh, that you, there's not a lot of James Bond type murders out there. Um, so silencers are very rare.
We had to really confront certain things. One was that for years after the murder, there was a lead suspect that was not the person charged. And so we had to talk about tunnel vision. We had to contrast, which was some pretty poor police work early on with the excellent police work, you know, at the end of this that, that led to these charges. That was another hurdle. You know, how can you be a seemingly normal person? And he had his quirks and his oddities, like most people do. Um, but how do you overcome convincing a jury that here's this guy, his whole first 20 some years on life has no acts of violence, three people are dead, and then another 35 years go by and no acts of violence. I researched that and it's not that uncommon uh, between people who do rage killings because there's a big difference between a rage killer and a serial killer. You know, a serial killer, they, they want to go kill somebody. They, they, that's what they are hoping to do. And I don't, like I said, I don't think Dean Kirsch woke up that morning saying, I'm gonna kill Beth today. I probably didn't, 10 minutes before he killed her, he probably wasn't thinking that. Um, he just snapped. We didn't expect him to confess at the end of the cross-examination, but, but making it clear that even he couldn't confront the physical evidence we had. I think something else that you had to notice was the difference between the statement that he gave in 1985 and then how he testified on the stand. He said that he knew Myers had called a complaint about the vehicle, but then tried to make it seem like he only knew that information, not because he was there and he heard the conversation, but because the next day that Mr. Myers told him Mr. Myers did testify. And that was one of the questions asked because when he, when his wife did speak to Beth that day or that evening, she told him to bring it back first thing in the morning. So when he drove up, the cops were already there. It was already cordoned off and had you know, tape and everything. And he didn't speak to anyone. He drove up and then saw what was happening and drove off. Jesse Dean Kirsch made it sound like Mr. Myers went across the street, which is where everybody was kind of staged while everything was going on. They had to be away from the crime scene and that Mr. Myers would have went over there and told them, well, my wife, not only does this not work, but my wife called last night around this time and was upset about this and, you know, the speedometer. And that just didn't happen. It didn't even make sense. In the end, it helped us because I think he, he seemed defensive. He seemed inconsistent. But Dean Kirsch, had a motive, he had the opportunity, he had the weapon, and I think at the end of this, when you go back there and you separate fact from fiction, you will find that the defendant killed and murdered Beth Wilburn, Tommy McGraw, and Craig James Otis. They've waited 40 years for today. They've waited 40 years for the sentence that this court is going to pronounce. Um, today their wait is over. We would ask that you uh, sentence Jesse Dean Kirsch to life in prison on all three counts. Uh, three lives at a young age, we'll cut short. Uh, all about the same age as you at the same time. You've lived for 40 years free uh, until the state was able to bring you to trial, and bring you to justice. Uh, it is the citizens of this court that in calls number 16, CRO 204, that you are hereby sentenced to life in prison. And in calls number 16, CRO 205, you are hereby sentenced to life in prison. And in calls number 16, CRO 206, you are hereby sentenced to life in prison. When I became a police officer, I'd always heard about that case and I was enamored with it and I always wanted to work on it. And then I was fortunate enough to get to work on it and then fortunate enough to work on it from the federal side with a lot more resources. And then to actually find the evidence that we needed to find the right person and arrest him, it was satisfying. I think sometimes there's an assumption that because the case is so old that, that the feelings from the surviving family members and victims 
will have lessened. And, and what we see is that's not the case at all. If, if anything, sometimes that is either festered or grown and, and just been an unanswered question for them for 40 years. And even Bob Curry, I mean, to spend your life being the suspect in a triple homicide in a city that didn't see crimes like that. Um, I mean, he spent most of his life like that, being under that cloud. And so kind of even giving him that peace of mind that 12 people knew that it wasn't him, that it was Jesse Dean Kirsch.